Hello everybody, this is Jughead, and welcome to my YouTube channel, where I am trying to archive all of the Jughead's Basement podcasts, one at a time. Maybe a couple one week, and then none for a couple of weeks. But the goal is to eventually have them line up so that I will be releasing them both as podcast and YouTube simultaneously in the future. Let's see if we can get there. Um, I'd like to s uh, direct you to our Patreon. You can go to our website, www.jugheadsbasementpodcast.com, and there's a button there where you can press Patreon, and, it, and it'll take you to a place called Patreon where you could join at our 2 5 and $10 tiers. At the 5 and $10 tiers, you'll get unedited videos of the interviews released to you before the at-home and on-the-road audience gets the audio podcast. Uh, I think it's a pretty good deal, and you also get some swag in the mail from me, so that's kind of nice, too. And you get to correspond with me with uh, occasional Q&A sessions where you can throw some questions at me, and I'll answer them for you about anything, and as honestly as I can. I will also say that these YouTube videos are not technically videos. They're just me Google searching the band and then throwing pictures up so that there's some sort of visual image with the more important aspect of it, the audio. In the future, I may release some of the actual videos of the interviews, but uh, right now that's a special thing for the patrons, and we'll see where that gets us. So, let's get into this very special uh, podcast I was able to put together many years ago on Crim Shrine. Crim Shrine is notorious for not really doing interviews about the band, so this is one of the only few documents that has all of the members participating. I was very proud of this one. Um, also, it sounded like Aaron Cometbus actually said yes to my interview and then went outside to the uh, streets of Brooklyn and dumpster dived a cell phone because his quality is very, very uh, sketchy. So um, on his particular parts, you might have to listen a little more carefully. Uh, from what I remember when I did this back in... Well, I'm going to look at the date soon. Anyway, so I, I'm very proud of this one, and I love that they all were honest and genuine, and they all contributed. All, actually, five members, if you would say. They were always a three-piece at one time, but uh, Jesse Michael stepped in for a while, Pete Ripon, Jeff Ott, and Aaron, of course, and also Paul Coran came in for the second half of the band. And you'll hear all about that in the podcast. So, just so you know, this was originally released on September 23rd in 2014. It is probably my largest downloaded episode, about 7,000 downloads. So, uh, let's do it. Could I say this, is, this, this may not fit into anywhere, um, but... Like, I think it's bad to look back on your own youth and say, like, oh, I was so stupid then. But, you know, it's true. You were. And in some ways, some of the stuff will seem a little silly. But that doesn't really bug me because, you know, that's almost what makes Come Shrine Best is a certain, is just this, like, total blossoming idealist excitement and sort of frenzy and franticness. Welcome to episode 14 of Jughead's Basement, featuring the Berkeley based band Crimp Shrine, including not a single record but a potpourri of songs spanning their full recording catalog. You just heard from drummer and co-lyricist Aaron Cometbus, who wrote the song you are listening to right now, called Another Day, recorded originally for the Turn It Around compilation. Crimp Shrine began in basements and garages in and around Berkeley, California in 1981. A rotating cast centering on band members Aaron Cometbus and Jeff Ott spent a goodly amount of their time as a band, mostly in rehearsals and playing a few gigs at house parties. Years passed before bassist Pete Ripens joined, and they eventually found themselves in a studio in 86 to record a demo. Crim Shrine was then asked to record two songs for the Maximum Rock and Roll double EP release of bands from the 924 Gilman Street punk scene called Turn It Around in 1987. 
Crimshine recorded a fairly extensive catalog of songs before disbanding in 1989, shortly after their one and only tour bringing them across the country in a van and back a few months later in an old beat-up Pinto. Their many years of writing and rehearsing brought forth only a little more than two years of release studio recordings. They are often quoted as being influential to the sound of such bands as Green Day, Operation Ivy, Jawbreaker, and it's no conjecture to say that my own band Screeching Weasel was deeply affected emotionally and creatively by our paths crossing with the charismatic personalities planted within Crimshrine. This podcast will feature interviews with Crimshrine band members Jeff Ott, Aaron Cometbus, Pete Ripens, and Paul Coran. Also including interviews with novelist musician Jesse Michaels, founder of bands such as Operation Ivy, Common Rider, and Classics of Love. And finally, producer-engineer Kevin Army. Also, it was agreed upon between Jeff Ott and myself to avoid concentrating on any one record, but instead to organize the podcast in order of four recording sessions conducted by Kevin Army from September 1987 through January 1989. And now I present to you selected sequential recordings from the catalog of Crimshrine. Learn the lesson, not to love anyone, now you don't This second track, Rearranged, was also recorded for the Turn It Around double EP. Alongside the bands Corrupted Morals, Sweet Baby Jesus, Isocracy, No Use for a Name, Operation Ivy, Sticky, Nasal Sex, Yeasty Girls, Rabid Lassie, Sewer Trout, and Bugger All. Before you hear Rearranged, you will hear from bassist Pete Ripens. What do you remember of the first recordings? The first recordings was a, a demo which uh, featured a bunch of songs by us, and then what we called an East Bay Sampler, which featured uh, some bands like uh, Quick Way was one of them, and Basic Radio was another. We recorded that on stage at Gilman Street, and it was a really, really sort of bad recording, uh, so it didn't give me a sense of any kind of uh, recording. But I like to think the first recording was that Dangerous Rhythm with Kevin Army, where we recorded the turn it around stuff with just a million other bands that day and everything and that was the first recording where i could hear our singing voices played back and i was shocked i was shocked at hearing particularly my singing voice you know was, I, I couldn't believe it. i was like i'm singing notes and they're kind of close to what i wanted them to sound like and 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 it just doesn't sound absolutely horrible to my to my head, so I mean, I'm I, I was ex- ex- really excited just to hear our singing voices played back. You were just moving bands in and out of that that space all day, right, during the recording. So it was pretty much in, get it done, get out. That's true. Except I think a lot of us wanted to be there uh, to watch all the all the bands record because you got to understand how big this seemed to somebody like me who had never experienced any studio environment prior to that. Aaron, where were you born and where were you raised? I was born in Berkeley, California, uh, North Berkeley in particular. One thing that actually made Crimshine particular is we are a very Berkeley band. And there's a particular culture there, uh, and for better or worse, there's a kind of a wingnut element and, and uh, of course, an old hippie element and a sort of deep anti-authoritarian streak. But there's something kind of funky but also a little bit moldy about North Berkeley in particular and uh, all of us were from there and I think that we might be unique in that from afar Berkeley just seems like one city but when you're there the different neighborhoods are very particular in terms of class or culture and uh, we are definitely from a certain neighborhood and nobody had come from out of state or from another city another school system. Yeah, I remember when me and Ben first came out there, I was surprised. I had never been to California before, but I was surprised how many people were not actually from California. It is fairly interesting that you were all from even the same area. Yeah, even to subtle things like... Um They caught a scene, I call it disaster. Down here, the kids grow fast and scared. Like Operation Ivy, what made them interesting was there were three people from Albany, you know, which is a small town next to Berkeley, uh, which is a very different culture, and one guy from Berkeley who was a professor's kid, and 
that was what made them special. So it, it is kind of important exactly where all the different people come from. Kevin, what do you do, and can you can you name some of the bands that you have worked with over the years that stick out in your memory? I'm a producer, engineer, um, worked with a lot of the early Gilman bands, did that first batch of stuff with Kern Shrine and Operation Ivy, Sweet Baby. Oh, I lost my girlfriend, and now I really bummed. Most of the Mr. T Experience catalog. Ba, 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 ba. And engineered Insomniac by Green Day. Mom and Dad don't look so hot, they say they get it over the hill. Your first recording with Crimshine uh, were at Dangerous Rhythms. Was that your own studio, and is that your studio currently? No studio currently. Yeah, I owned that for about two years. I bought it from Matt Wallace, and when he wanted to get out, I'd been working there, and I bought the place. All that stuff, like the Gilman stuff, like turned around and Crimshine was kind of towards the end of me on it, I think. Uh, so since then, have you just been more for hire at different studios? And I haven't done anything for about 12 years. Oh, wow. Okay. See, that shows what I know. <laughs> <laughs> I got jaded. I dropped out. You know, it wasn't the same. Nothing could be as exciting as that early Gilman stuff. It all peaks at that first session for Turn It Around. I met... Crim Shrine, Sweet Baby, and Op Ivy. That was an amazing session. That was amazing times, amazing bands. I mean, they were all kids, right? Yeah. They were all very young, inexperienced, so no one knew what they were doing, which is good. <laughs> <laughs> we could just rush it for the project because there was no money. David Hayes put that together. There was no money to do it. So we just rushed people in and out. They got two takes. And um, I remember before Crim Shrine, while they were getting set up and the guys in the other bands were all coming up going, oh god you gotta hear this bass player he's amazing he's like the greatest bass player ever crew trying was one of those standout bands to me when i went through the rhythm tracks for everyone and then they'd get to do a take or two for vocals and when i heard those those two songs rearranged them another day i was like these are great songs it's totally raw in there totally great pop songs too Track number three in this sequential viewing of Crimshrine is Over the Years, which was not originally on the list Jeff and I created, but during Aaron's interview, he mentioned it in passing, and I just had to include it here. Hard to me looking back on it later, the things that hold us the best are the things that seem the most totally honest. And there's the song Over the Years, not one of our songs that's well known. To me, that's like that's a really honest song. And and I think Pretty Mess and Summertime are the same way. But I wish that we'd been a little. I think we were trying so hard to like find answers or we'd state a sort of a problem in a song and then come up with an answer for it. And I like the bands more where, like, Naked Rig and... There's something about their libido. I can't even talk about that now, 25 years later. You know, I think of, I think it's actually a little braver just to say, like, I feel crazy, I'm scared, I'm lonely, I don't want to fuck, I'm not comfortable in my body. It's just something that, that I think at the time I would have thought was too too obvious but actually it, it takes a little bit more depth to, to just spell it out and I think the songs that we have that just spelled it out a little bit more those are the ones that to me have the most resonance still I mean this is what you're supposed to do in a punk band is get up and talk about stuff that you can't talk to your friends about and you can't say at a party but you can get on stage and yell and that's what I wish we did more and I feel like they're, they're the times that we did, you know, the song over the years, like I said, it's just, you know, like, it's, it doesn't try to find the solution. It's just saying, it's just like an open wound. Was there things learned between that first session and the next section with Kevin Army? Uh, the next session that we had with Kevin Army, uh, again, we recorded it at the same studio, and we had... Uh, uh, you know, no money to do it, and so everything was uh, performed on the first take and sung on the first take, and 
and we just did it very, very fast. And I think the most time was spent uh, mixing and, and EQing and all that sort of thing. But it was amazing. We had eight tracks, and so it, it was. <laughs> it was huge. Aaron, was there different levels of comfortability between being in rehearsal, recording, and playing live in Crimshine? I'm not sure if it's well known. We we were not a great live band. We were not one of those live bands that takes everyone right away and uh, mm-hmm. makes you feel great if you're, you know, if you're in an awful mood. You know, equipment fell apart. We were inconsistent. Our equipment was not so good and usually borrowed. You know, I think live, sometimes, you know, we had a spirit or a kind of scrappiness that people responded to, but it wasn't like this great wall of sound. So definitely rehearsal always. Yeah, rehearsal for me always been the best part of being in the band and recording. And we were lucky in that uh, when we recorded, it actually, we had pretty good luck in the studio. We, we worked with good folks. But I don't know. I remember when we first went into the studio and I was worried that I, I, I hate it when I listen to a to a song and it doesn't sound like the person is thinking about what they're singing about. It sounds like they're thinking about singing. And I was worried that Pete and Jeff wouldn't convey that. And I was very happy instead uh, that it didn't feel like that at all. They you know, there was no self-consciousness, and they just lit right into it. So we were definitely better in the studio and in rehearsal. I think the shows were fun, and they had elements that don't come across now. We we had all kinds of odd, free stuff that we made that we would throw out into the crowd, and visually we just like we were weird looking, but uh, we were not up by we were not like jumping up and down, and. <laughs> you know, like to a roaring audience. The next three tracks, recorded in September of 87 by Kevin Army, were released on the EP Sleep, What's That? Here is Jeff Ott talking about the song Bricks. I primarily wrote it coming out of a frustration with the Revolutionary Communist Youth Brigade that uh, was trying to uh, attach themselves to any naturally forming, I don't want to say movement even, just like... At various points in time in Berkeley, there'd be like a takeover of a foreclosed uh, single residency hotel, you know, like a welfare hotel where a bank foreclosed on it, it's empty, and everyone would take it over. Like there's one literally across the street from People's Park for quite a while. And they would totally come in and attach themselves and try and get what was happening to become part of their thing. They'd just try and, like, co-opt any energy of any kind of uh, rebellious anything. And it really bummed me out because the stuff that they were trying to co-opt was just really vitally important to me. And it it actually still bums me out. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, Yes. Jeff, where were you uh, born and raised? Um, I was born at Kaiser Permanente Hospital in Oakland, California, as was my older daughter, primarily in the East Bay of the San Francisco Bay Area, Berkeley, Oakland, with a little bit of, you know, San Francisco and Minnesota thrown in. You were pretty much on your own from an early age. So somewhere at like 13 or 14, I started running away and intermittently being thrown out. And it was sort of odd in the sense that, you know, one day they're like, get out and don't come back. And the next day they're like sending the cops to try and make me come home and stuff. But four months old when I was adopted by them until 13 or 14, things were relatively awful except in the, um, there was food, money, clothing, all that kind of stuff. But otherwise... Pretty bad. In the midst of all that, you found music or, or guitar. Uh, what influenced you to pick up a musical instrument? You know, um, I'm going to say almost none of it was conscious in the sense that uh, for me, piano lessons started at the age of four with uh, Elizabeth Wegley, who's on Facebook and sends me messages once in a while. So I definitely want to say her name because it would be hilarious if she actually heard this. <laughs> uh, to the extent that my parents and other people thought that piano lessons should be all about classical music, I, I really hated it to the extent that there is a little bit of like um, 
learning about blues and, and uh, ragtime and stuff, I liked it. But pretty much, I, I couldn't tell you what year Highway to Hell came out, but the point at which I heard that on the radio for the first time, my interest in piano just sort of fell through the floor. Sort of like, how do I pull up? East. The, but they had a, a melody that wasn't so far away from what we were doing, basically, in the punk scene. I mean, I was using all of the scales and whatever that I learned from Judas Priest. <laughs> right, right, yeah, because they weren't really like player, you know, they weren't really dissonant, all minor at all. So, so what you're saying is that, yeah, you had the musical uh, piano influence, but what made you want to be more of like an actual performing musician was hearing more hard rock stuff on the radio. Huh? Well, I, that's what made me want to sit down a piano and pick up a guitar. Sleep? What's that? Man, I was listening to that actually on my way to work so that I could pay my uh, house payment the other day, and I realized that some of it might not be terribly obvious. You know, at the point at which I'm a homeless teenager, it became very apparent that the notion of America being a free society is is really contingent on a person's ability to accept a lot of unacceptable things. Foremost being, unless you're born into a wealthy family, you necessarily have to do anywhere from a few things you don't like on a daily basis to something you absolutely hate all day, every day, just in order to be able to go to sleep at night without somebody coming and arrest you for sleeping in public. I think that was sort of the perspective on that issue from that time, I also noticed that in terms of first versus third person, how it's written, I think I was saying them sometimes instead of us or me, which sort of struck me as odd then. But in a fundamental way, any person, point blank, will look at the wastefulness of our society and go, that's just dumb. And then, you know, we have this uh, large set of scary possibilities if we don't do what we're supposed to. And we develop a rationale that says, well, it's okay because blah, blah, blah. Aaron, what influenced you to pick up a musical instrument? And were these the same influences that propelled you to become a live performer of music? No idea. <laughs> I, I will say, though, in terms of the roots of the band, I always liked very simple, straight-ahead punk, but for some reason I thought it was important to play music that was more experimental. I thought, I don't know why, it wasn't the music I listened to, but in the early years of the band, I played guitar for a little while with two strings, Jeff played keyboards, he played piano, we had a violin player, uh, I used a lot of tape loops, I had... Uh, Long before I played regular drums, I had a kind of stand-up percussion arrangement with all sorts of weird toys and odd African necklaces that I'd bang on and stuff. So we definitely weren't actually coming from being a straightforward punk band. I think it was actually when I saw that the band was going to fall apart because, you know, he was more interested in actually just being in a straight-ahead punk band, that I realized, oh, okay, I should actually get a regular drum set and try that. And so we became a, a more traditional band kind of by accident. But uh, going back, I mean, even to childhood or whatever, do you have, like, a first instrument that you started playing? No, I didn't grow up with music. Uh, my, my family was not was not musical, and nor was there any music in the house except for the... Uh, the three notes sign on for NPR. It was definitely not something I grew up with. My, uh, my parents didn't listen to records or anything. Punk was, you know, something I got into on my own. And uh, we played music together, and I was in bands, but didn't play live for probably the first five or six years. So it was definitely not the sense of you go to a show and you form a band and you're playing a month later. I actually like to think that the people who stick around longer are usually the ones who didn't get on stage right away for a while. There was a band that moved from the name uh, SAG or SAG into Crimshrine. This I have found basic details about. But can you fill me in on that process from one to the other, which included your friend of many years, Jesse Michaels? And also, if it fits into this narrative, uh, how did you meet Jeff? 
I should say first that, you know, I, I don't generally talk about Prim Shrine. Unfortunately, sometimes you do things in there for other people to enjoy. I mean, you know, you do them and you're enjoying it, but in, in hindsight, later, other people can listen to it. It doesn't have that same baggage. And so it's a little bit painful to talk about, even though I'm proud of a lot of the songs and I'm proud of the sort of legacy. I think I'm more proud of just the spirit of it and, yeah, the story of it than the actual music. But some parts of the story I can't get that into. You know, it wasn't like we had one band, SAG, and then it morphed into Crim Shrine. Me and Jesse played together. Jeff joined. Eventually, it was just me and Jeff, and there was, like I said, a violin player for a while. Uh, Jeff and I switched instruments as we were playing. You know, sometimes we both played guitar, sometimes he played drums at first, I played guitar, he played keyboards, he played piano, and there was always other people coming in playing bass later on. Yeah, it's sort of just a confused it was something, it, it seems a little strange now to have a band and to be rehearsing two or three times a week and not even be considering playing shows. But we were also an instrumental band. Uh, SAG wasn't. But then we sort of drifted into doing all sorts of, um, you know, we had songs and we rehearsed all the time. But they were instrumental. And in fact, finally, somehow it came out that Jeff actually did have lyrics for some of the songs that he was scared to mention it. He thought I would disapprove, I think. And uh, I was like, oh, well, <laughs> okay. Well, why don't you sing then? So, you know, it, it just, it happened naturally in a in a kind of weirdly unnatural environment. But, uh, but I think when we actually were a regular band and finally started playing, there was almost a surprise because we've been playing for so many years already. And I think, you know, for me, it was also scary because people knew me as and people knew the band originally as I did a, I did a fanzine and I often was writing critically about other bands and so when I finally had my own band everyone of course you know had a had a good time making fun of me and so doing a fanzine is not behind the scenes you're right in the scene but it is different than being on stage and I I didn't actually it wasn't like a dream of mine to be on stage. I'm not a natural performer. And it was exciting to then become one. But it was, you know, it was a little terrifying at first. Essentially, at, um, I think, 10, there's a summer camp in Berkeley that's primarily on the UC campus uh, using their sports facilities, you know. And so you go and do bowling for a couple hours and soccer for a couple hours and volleyball for a couple hours. So the first year I did that, Aaron was both in the soccer and the bowling and then the second year, he was in the bowling, and uh, he and um, John Kiffmeyer were in the soccer with me. And so I already knew Aaron as a kid from summer camp. That was it. I only knew him from there. I didn't know where he lived or what he did or where he went to school or anything like that. He was a couple years older than me. But once I got to junior high school, instead of all kids just basically being kids, all of a sudden there was sort of the free kids it was a small handful of people, but Jesse Michaels being one of them. So when I started hanging out with them, at some point, just my fidgetiness and my propensity to get in trouble for uh, tapping and drumming on desks and stuff like that during class, Jesse was like, you drum on stuff all the time. You want to be in a band? And I just said, sure, okay. So that weekend, I went to his house and turned out the other person in the band was Aaron, even though I had no idea they were connected to each other at all. And I think before I got there, I think Jesse was like playing drums and singing and Aaron was playing the two string guitar tuned to a bar chord. So then I started playing the, I'll say drum because there wasn't multiple drums. And then Jesse became just vocal at that point. I guess I was 12 then. Jesse Michaels, years and years prior to starting the band Operation Ivy, you knew both Jeff and Aaron. Tell us a little bit about how you met. When I was a very young child, literally probably four years old, I had some friends who, neighbor's kids, who I played with across the street. Aaron used to come over once in a while, so I, I met Aaron when I was probably four. You know, we were in the same Berkeley school system, so I think I saw him around throughout my childhood. I became actually friends with him when I was around 11 or 12, and, uh, you know, we got into punk together. The 
first we were into comic books, and then we didn't see each other for a couple years. We were both really obsessive kids, so we immediately kind of picked each other out because when it was comic books, we were super, super obsessed with comic books. Then the next time we saw each other, we were both obsessed with punk. He was farther along than me because he had an older brother who was into it. Then we just sort of bonded more through our interest in punk music and became pretty close friends. Jesse, how did that lead to a, a band being formed? Well, me and Aaron had a limited amount of music. We had, I mean, we had a, a decent amount of the old, old punk stuff. But one of the bands we were really into was Flipper. And so we started playing music that we made ourselves. You know, just with a tape recorder and amp and a drum practice pad. Uh, that was very inspired by Flipper. And uh, so that was how the whole thing started. We added Jeff. Uh, and by the way, I'm not claiming to be a founding member of Crimshine. I'm just saying we started playing together. We added Jeff. We changed our name a lot. One was Revolution Through Apathy. One was SAG. He had the initials of SAG, which we drew out of a hat. At that time in the early hardcore days, there was all these bands that would have three letter, you know, D-R-I, M-I-A, three letter names. We just picked any three letters um, out of a hat as kind of a parody of that because it was really so generic. Every band was three letters. And then our three letters we had, you know, a long list of what they could stand for. Some of the ones I remember were um, Stupid Aaron Group, Silver Aryan Gorillas. Jesse moved to Pittsburgh, I, I think... He was kicked out of the band before I moved to Pittsburgh, but I could have that in reverse order. I'm not. Re now we must have kicked him out, and then he went to Pittsburgh or something. Humorously, you know, there was like um, back when you could call somebody and then have a I don't know what they call it party line or something now, where you could call two different people at the same time, right? So it was like we were kicking Jesse out of the band, although I don't think I had any part of the decision. It was like I'm going to be in on the call though or something, and I just sort of listened mainly. Amusingly now is that um, that was all about, oh, uh, well, Jesse gets high all the time and blah, blah, blah. But I'm, not to brag, but really I'm twice the addict that Jesse could ever be. In my mind. Prior to being 18 years old, I got very incomplete and somewhat bizarre stories on the narrative of my adoption and what was happening before I was four months old when I was adopted. And part of those stories are that father was either Korean or black. What I didn't understand then is that my, in California, any adoptee has the right for $99.99 to non-identifying medical information from the agency that uh, conducted the adoption or lawyer that conducted the adoption. My parents had that, and I didn't know that until I was breaking into drawers looking for money to get dope and found it. So when I wrote the song, my understanding is that, well, my father's either Korean or black, and Korean didn't, well, neither one seemed too realistic, but... Then when you add on to that, that uh, my older daughter, Vanessa, is one-fourth African-American, uh, but lighter skin than me, uh, brighter red hair than me, sunburns quicker, green eyes instead of brown like me. So in a way, what I understood about myself was that outwardly you would say I'm a white guy, but my understanding at the time was that one parent was black and all of it seemed somewhat dubious to me, <laughs> you know? I, I looked at it and went, that doesn't make much sense, but then I had a daughter with a black woman and she's lighter than me, so who the fuck knows, right? Am I a white man? No! Am I a black man? So Pete, where were you born and raised? In Berkeley, California. I was born in Alta Bates Hospital, and I was raised in North Berkeley on Broadway Street. Uh, Pete, what started uh, your music journey, meaning what influenced you uh, originally to, to pick up an instrument? I saw some people doing it, friends of mine, uh, one in particular, and that made it look incredibly fun. Uh, the, the person that I saw that made it look so unbelievably fun was a guy named Dave Edwardson. He played uh, at the time in a band called uh, Public Enema, and then later he played in Violent Coercion, and the rest of his career he spent playing in Neurosis. What age were you around then? Early, early teens, probably 13. 
were you actually going to concerts at that age? I was, but mainly uh, really big ones. Uh, I mean, the first concert I went to was uh, The Who with The Clash and T-Bone Burnett. But yeah, the first punk rock show I ever went to was In a House Party. And that was the next year when I was 14. But yeah, I, I, I met Dave Ed around then. What's your uh, your band timeline before Crimshine? Were you in bands prior? I was in... No, not really. <laughs> I mean, I, I did some things with, with the high school jazz bands at Berkeley High School, and I did some stuff with some stoner buddies just playing rock influence type of things with no singer. For, for crying out loud and you know <laughs> yeah I always talk about that my first band was actually a metal band called Torturer but we never made it out of the basements and I we never even had a show never had a drummer that's my first band <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the guys in, in uh, Crimshrine Jeff and Aaron they would call they used to call it because the other guys were kind of bunk and so they called it Poser Pete and the Jazz Fusions and, and I, I know not why because it was more rock kind of music, but anyway. How does that wind up with you being in the band? In junior high school, when I was 12 or 13, I met Jeff, and we spent a lot of time in science class. And what we did in there was, you know, idle passage of time type of stuff, trying to make each other laugh, etc. Dave Ed actually uh, told me that it might be a good idea to try playing with them. And I was surprised that they had done anything together because uh, I was unaware that they were in a band, starting a band, or any of that sort of thing. It was in Jeff's basement that we uh, first did anything, and I and I don't remember how I got it got a hold of them. Um, probably on the schoolyard because we all went to the same high school, Berkeley High School, and I had been playing bass for. Probably two years at that point, a year and a half, two years at that point. But I, I came in ready to play in any band because I practiced so much all the time. The next four songs, according to Jeff, were recorded for no particular reason. Sometime in the beginning of 1988, before their one and only U.S. tour in September, with recording musicians Pete, Aiden, Aaron, and Jeff. Before discussing those four songs, we will hear from Aaron talking about the writing process for Kumshrine. One of the sweetest parts of a band, of, of any band, is sometimes you'll be listening to a tape of some other music, and at the end there'll be kind of weird sounding thing and you don't understand what it is at first and then you hear your hand slapping your knee and then you're like okay you ready one two three four and there's an acoustic guitar and you work it's it's you and the other person in the band working out the song and it's the first tape of that and that you know we're, we weren't the kind of band that jams in the rehearsal studio and comes up with a bunch of riffs and strings them together and then writes lyrics. We were definitely the outside the party or 4 a.m. in someone else's room, hitting your knees with your hands and working out stuff on acoustic guitar and singing together. So, yeah, the songs were, were written acoustic, uh, I think, without exception. And in terms of completed songs, I don't actually write the music. I don't no notes very well. I, I would write a few little parts, but mostly I would sing the song. And, you know, when I work with guitarists, I, I sing the song and then they kind of, it is a collaboration. I can hear the music, but they can hear what I'm hearing or they hear something cooler and different. And so that's always been the collaborative process. I think some songs probably were brought in complete, uh, but not by me. Jeff, track number seven on this sequence is My Friend. I was listening to My Friend a couple days ago, and it tripped me out because there's the first version and the second version. And I think the first version's on the demo, and the words are very different. And the second version, the changes in words were not made by me, and in retrospect, I have no idea how I agreed <laughs> to them being changed because 
essentially the changes were like uh, an attempt to manufacture. Uh, if Jeff just understands this, he'll be able to control his drug use. And it's, um, it's just impossible. It's totally natural for any person to see another person totally sick. We solve almost every problem with our minds. As human beings, we have a problem, we figure out how to solve it, then we implement it. We solved it with our mind. And uh, alcoholism and addiction is a thing that the mind is just useless against. And it's totally normal and it's not selfish or it's, it's not wrong to take the normal track to try and solve this. You know, for somebody else to think, I'm going to get Jeff to finally understand what this is and then he'll get better. That's not selfish, but it's just, it doesn't work. But did they converse with you about changing some lyrics or did they just write it out? I'm confused on how it... Uh, okay, so if you listen to, um, I think it's on the demo. I don't know if it's on the demo, but I think it's on the demo. It's just, I think it's the same verse twice, just simple, can I cook cold pack of cigarettes, flower by my bedside uh, myself my life my love my hair my and my pride don't know where I'm going know where I'm coming from want to take a few hits and fire under the sun is kind of all it says then the rewrite is all this oh but now I realized wrong blah 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 <laughs> at the time I went okay yeah we can do it that way I probably just didn't feel comfortable saying no but I don't know what the hell I was thinking when I agreed to it <laughs> Here, here's something I didn't write down, but actually both Pete and Aaron had spoke to uh, when I talked about being in the studio that there was something that really sort of blew their minds once they heard the voices, because uh, in rehearsals, you don't, you know, it's all a mix of, you know, loud things and soft things, but that there was sort of a revelation to, for them once they heard your, your voice and Pete's voice uh, singing. Did you have any sort of experience like that, that with, those, with those first recordings? <laughs> Um, somewhat, although because you can hear what's inside your head, whether there's a PA or not. And I don't think I've been in a band that had a PA until about, I don't know, 1995, literally, that uh, I, I could always kind of hear my voice. And, you know, perhaps Pete could, but Pete was uh, 10 times as anxious than me and, and also way more self-condemning for no particular reason, usually in a way that's opposite of reality. That was horrible. Oh my god, Pete, that was amazing. <laughs> you know. So yeah, in a way, because there never were PA's or even microphones, that once we were finally in a studio and could hear everything, that part of it was really awesome, although I, I sort of kind of knew what it was like leading up to that. Um, this, I'm going to ask this question. I, I'm not as confident with it, but I think it'll lead to something. So, uh, Jeff, uh, was there different levels of comfortability between being in rehearsal, recording, and playing live in Crimshine? And then this question goes on. Was anyone more natural than the other? And did this vary with other bands who have been in? For me, rehearsal was way more comfortable because nobody was there. Um, I, I, I could be worked up with quite a bit of anxiety if it even if it was just me and Aaron over like oh what does he think you know mm. um, as time goes on eventually I end up being loaded all the time and that starts to be less and less of an issue although I will say you know in the way that alcohol makes everything a little more comfortable when you're anxious things like LSD sometimes make them way more anxiety <laughs> 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 but but in general the, the severity of, of anxiety really got sort of um, uh, brought down by being loaded all the time. Pretty anxious with performing live in front of people uh, to this day, even. But um, most of the time, I really ended up liking it. It's really sort of an exercise in, um, I have anxiety, I can turn around and run or I can walk through it and see what happens and in general it's always been a lesson in if I just walk through whatever I'm afraid of it ends up being fine and it actually ends up being fun but generally uncomfortable for the first I don't know 10 or 20 years <laughs> <laughs>
track number eight, Summertime, will be discussed by Jeff Ott. And then you will hear from Kevin Army, Summertime. Seven years old, uh, my best friend who I knew starting in preschool through second grade, uh, his father had gotten asthma super duper bad and they moved uh, into uh, coastal a few hours north California, pretty far up. And I would go there in the summers and hang out, you know, a couple weeks, couple months sometimes. Uh, being there in the summer was totally actually like being in the movie Stand By Me. It was totally just like train tracks and everything. Um, no dead bodies, but all the rest of it was pretty much spot on. And very early on, crush on his older sister before I could have even told you what a crush is. You know, then eventually I was a teenager and that just didn't seem like part of the reality. Suddenly I'm like in 17, 18, 19, totally using on a daily basis. Ended up there a couple times and pursued the thing with her, uh, with his sister, which of course is not a good idea at all. You know, really that song is just about that. Although, you know, after writing it, that whole situation got uglier. It went from complicated to just bad, all, all just because of me doing what I do. I hear it now, and it's, I think everything that came after doesn't really change that the song in the first place was pretty much uh, just what was going on and honest and good in that way. Somehow or another, we had to uh, make lyrics very different when it went on the thing that ate Floyd. Somehow it became a letter from the band to Jake while we were on tour. We redid the words for the lyric sheet as though the song was about writing Jake a letter. The Jake that Jeff is referring to is Jake Sales, who was known as the Crimshrine Roadie, and later in 89 became part of the East Bay hardcore band known as Phil. <laughs> Well, see, a lot of these early bands, what's special about that stuff is they're so inexperienced. It's not self-conscious about anything, really. It's just people setting up and playing music. I mean, maybe it's not about writing their songs ahead of time. Uh, I mean, the most would enter is that Aaron always has a strong opinion on mixing. He likes things very raw. Of course, having no money to actually spend any time at it kind of ensures that. He likes to turn everything down almost inaudible to mix sometimes. I mean, see, like at the time, I would work with other bands. You want a studio, you work with all kinds of people. And I've always been lucky that most of the people I worked with were in the direction of what I like. But once in a while, I would get a band that had what I would call the Masterwork Syndrome, where they're trying to make Boston's third album in an eight track studio in West Oakland <laughs> <laughs> or East Oakland. I mean, I'm just like, and, and you would see them, they'd have these preconceived notions, and, and they would just, of course, end up making garbage. So you've got a band like Crow Shrine, it's just totally the opposite. It's just kind of like setting up and playing at Gilman, only they overdub the vocals. It's almost more like documenting people than what we think of as studio recording sometimes. People come in and they play, and then we send them away. As far as I could get, it was like before one of the sessions telling Aaron, you might want to get new drum heads. He comes to the studio, he's very proud of himself. He's changing these really filthy, overused drum heads he has and putting on another pair of less filthy slightly used drum heads. <laughs> and he goes, look, Kevin, I got new drum heads. And I'm like, those aren't new. He goes, yeah, no, I got them out of the dumpster. <laughs> and I was just like, and that, that shows you, I think, you know, and that's part of the term. They're not playing with good equipment. That guitar is something else. There's a part of me that goes back and hears things like that that wants to be a, you know, good engineer and I hear stuff like that and I go, oh my God. But then the part of me that is a fan of that kind of thing and I'm just like, exactly what it should be. Everything about Jeff is a thing unto itself, the guitar and the voice. That guitar is so exceedingly raw, yet it's obviously a guy who knows how to play the guitar. Like, that sound usually isn't from someone who knows how they can play guitar, you know? You know, that's one of those things, if you have a lot of money, the engineer or producer would go and put a new amp up and then probably say, would you like to play another guitar? So without that time, just put up a mic and there it is. It's very similar to his voice to me sonically. There are these just like unbelievably raw expressions of so much stuff, you know? I mean, running the whole range from just kind of gritty, ugly stuff to a beautiful version of that too. It's a very unique thing. Pete, he's a busy bass player. He's so distinctive. 
Aaron and Jeff are very distinctive players, so they have three distinctive and very dizzy players. It's just exploding with everyone playing a lot. Pete, I want to talk a little bit about your uh, your bass playing. I'm not, I, I feel like these questions aren't great, but hopefully it leads somewhere. Let's see. First, it's very apparent in the Crimshine tracks, also in your in your later band, Tilt, uh, that your bass playing is great. Can you describe your sound and playing style? Um, I think that my, my bass playing style is extremely melodic, and I was just uh, utilizing tons and tons of, of advanced knowledge and in, in trying to apply it to music where it normally wasn't uh, at the time. I said it to people like I brought rock bass into punk. I mean, that's what I said to people. I think that's a little a little too basic uh, in reality. You got to understand that I, I played along with records that I really didn't like very much, recognizing that the bass players were standard setters and that they were doing things that if you could play along with those records then you have improved to some degree if you can actually pull it off and so yeah i was taking a lot of things from you know sort of crappy bands and and making it sound uh like something i would want to listen to what do you mean by like crappy bands i just want to get a perspective of what you're talking about people don't really like listening to the yellow jackets people don't really well punkers don't like listening to rush rockers do i love rush it, like i said they raise the standard in, when it comes to bass playing and, and that guy does I just don't find the music all that. Um, I look at it as more like if you were an athlete and you were looking at another athlete who's extremely good, perhaps better at whatever athletic endeavor you're doing. I listen to Rush like an inferior athlete would admire a champion. I don't know anything about base technicality, but it really does stick out. Was there a choice to make it more high endy than most bass players do? I wanted that because I recognized at the time that the notes uh, I was playing were providing a good deal of the melody in the band. And so I wanted those notes to be heard, and they just don't get heard if you choose a more bassy tone. That was my opinion, and I think the tone did suffer for it. Um, it's not the most pleasant sounding bass to listen to in terms of warmth but all the notes really did ring ring through and i think came out strong melodically wake up i think i wrote it immediately after being in a pbs tv show about teens and drug use when I was a teenager. And they had this uh, panel discussion at a high school in Berkeley. I think I was probably just 14 at the time. And, you know, ostensibly the show was going to be all about, oh, kids are using drugs, this is so horrible, blah, blah, blah. But they were starting to go down this road, I think with the assumption that we were going to tell the story, oh, I did drugs and everything was horrible and it's so bad and I'm glad I stopped, not realizing that a couple of us hadn't stopped and had no intention of stopping. And the thing sort of devolved into, they would be all, well, you blah, 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 blah. And the other kid or I would be like, uh, yes, but you do things every day that you don't want to <laughs> in order to have money. And they'd be like, well, that's not the same thing. And we're like, well, but you just said we're doing things we don't want to in order to have drugs. So how is it not the same thing? As a show, I think it sort of backfired on them. Afterwards, just that experience, uh, I sat down and wrote that song. And also, you know, uh, on a lot of occasions, I would, on school days, uh, be awake all night on acid or whatever and uh, watch national news, but not news, instead news magazine. Mm -hmm. So shortly after that, there's literally like a show on people addicted to pot you know and i was just looking at that going ah that's ridiculous i've noticed there are a few songs where i don't know how i knew what i was writing then because i didn't actually understand all the stuff until 30 years later but it's now 30 years later and our society is just finally coming to grips with the fact 
that the drug war is a complete failure. It could have easily been predicted to be a complete failure if you just look at the one that happened before it and was a complete failure. That it's carried out in a way that massively incarcerates people who actually haven't committed crime against other people. I had no idea about any of that when I wrote the song. I just knew that I like to get high and why don't certain people just leave me the fuck alone about it? <laughs> right? Can you feel that? Yeah, so um, that one is also literally true. And it turns out that once in a while, somebody has to go out and disprove the great teenage myths. Otherwise, they would be teenage truths. So one of those is you can't get pregnant the first time you have sex. So anyway, uh, towards the end of being 14, uh, myself and my daughter's mom, uh, I don't think it was the first time she had sex, but that's neither here nor there, was for me. And we became pregnant and... I don't know, probably at um, probably a few months in, there was a lot of, oh, I think I am, no, I'm not really, oh, I think I am, no, I'm not really, but we never got it together to like buy the $2 pregnancy test to know for sure, but so anyway, the point at which that issue clarified itself for me, I, like on a lot of days back then, was on acid, and uh, she showed up and was like, oh, here, check this out, and put my hand on her uterus, and there's movement, and I was like, Okay. <laughs> Aaron, on Wikipedia, you are recorded as having been in 23 bands, small and large, including Crim Trine, Sweet Baby, and Pinhead Gunpowder. And alongside this, you've been a writer and a journalist, including Maximum Rock and Roll, a novel called I Wish There Was Something That I Could Quilt, and most prolifically, with your own zine, Comet Bus, which you have dedicated time to for over 30 years. Do you ever find your music career and your writing career in conflict? I feel like I should answer it two different ways. Uh, there's no conflict, so that's no that problem. They don't seem to me to be separate worlds, but they influence each other in that probably my whole life since Crimshine has been trying to make X Crimshine not be part of my name. So, in a way, the band in general, but that band in particular, is sort of a negative inspiration, and, you know, I'm proud of what we did, but... The idea of, of you know being known mostly for being in one band that's broken up always seemed totally depressing to me. So in fact, it's been even if it's a for a bad reason that actually was was good for me. It made me work really hard to keep doing more and more things just so I didn't have X attached to my name. And so definitely, you know, I probably would have continued doing the magazine. I uh, I'm sure I would have had other bands, but I think that there was a little bit of a mania trying to always do more new things just so that I, I wasn't stuck with one label like that. Besides my love of music, a reason for this podcast is that I felt like an outsider amongst outsiders while I traveled in bands. And in many ways, I think it helped uh, to keep my take on life skewed. I was constantly confounded yet entertained by the scene. Uh, but the repercussion was that I never felt I, I got to know the people and the bands that surrounded me. And they, I felt, even knew me even less. Uh, many of these interviews are attempts to fill in gaps and hopefully in the present to minimize the distance I, that I actually still feel. No, oh, that's, that's wonderful. No, it's very strange. Sometimes you're, you're deep in it, and at the same time, you know, I mean, now there's a lot of people who you, you're running with, and you just don't actually realize what they might be going through or what, uh, you know, what their last name is, what their background is, and even though you're right there in the middle of it with them. It takes, you know, 10 or 20 years to be like, oh, wait, who were they? We're kind of like voyeurs, I guess, to our own lives. <laughs> uh, it's weird because, sure, you might have felt like those two worlds were very separate, like your plays and the band, but we knew that you did those things on the side, just like we knew that Murray Bowles played viola for the symphony orchestra. You didn't have to witness it just to, to actually kind of respect the fact that, right, he does have this other life going on which made, you know, made you and him both seem like, ah, this is part of what they do, but not the, not the whole thing. Jeff, I'm going to move into the, uh, well, the infamous uh, mythological tour by now. Uh, I think Crimshine had one tour. Many things happened. But can you describe the, the state of the band before leaving 
So we left on July 20th, and for some reason that seems to be the first day of tour always. I don't know why. Before that, on uh, June 24th, I turned 18, and we went to one single show, play a single show, not part of the tour, in Las Vegas. And the day I turned 18, we went and uh, met Danny from Fuck Shit Piss and from Flesh and Bones, who was putting on shows at a, it was like the cement foundation of a sewage treatment plant way out in the desert that never got finished, that he put on shows at with generators. So we went to his house, we picked him up, he said, we gotta stop by 7-Eleven, these girls want to ride, and so we went to 7-Eleven, we picked up these two teenagers, and they brought them with us and went out to the show. We didn't really know at the time that they had run away from home earlier that day, And we're out at the show, and other bands are playing, and then we're playing, and we're unaware of it, but one of the girl's uncles drove out to the place, found out that's where she went, drove out to the place, was somewhat drunk, was threatening people, and a couple people, like, talked him down and got him to leave. He left and got really drunk, and then he came back to get her again, and he head-on with a car with three kids in it. And we got done playing, and we packed up the van, and we were driving out, and all of a sudden there's like five miles of cars just parked on this dirt road going back, and there's no other way. And we walked up to the front, and he's sitting there with his arm out the window, dead. And the, uh, like, one fire department ambulance had gotten up there, and they were tearing apart the car with the kids in it, trying to get them out. And uh, I just sort of stood there and watched it, and eventually they got the three kids out. Then eventually uh, the coroner got there and actually uh, dealt with the guy. And that allowed everybody to actually leave because they wouldn't let anybody drive through until the coroner got there and took photos, right? So we're all standing in the middle of the night out in the desert, dead guy, halfway hanging out of his car. But when it became clear what had happened... Uh, Right when we got up there at first, Danny was like, he had already been in trouble for putting shows on out there, like got caught doing it before police-wise. And he was like, do you guys remember where my house is? We're like, yeah. He's like, "Uh, meet me there as soon as you can get there. And he's like wearing shorts and uh, tennis shoes, and he just runs off into the desert. (laughs) He just runs off. And so right at about sunrise, we got got out of there finally and got to his house and picked him up. And uh, he's like, I got to get out of Nevada. So we took him home, and Jesse and Jake already had the house uh, there in Oakland, and so he stayed there for a while, uh, at which point, um, the day after I turned 18, he showed me how to do tattoos and gave me a a soup tattoo, but um, somehow, uh, and I didn't understand it at the time at all, and I don't even know if I could adequately describe it now, but somehow everything uh, became a lot more serious on that day and in a general sense by the time you know I was 17 just turning 18 I had already been hiding in a few different places to avoid being put in a in a lockdown facility um, for what ostensibly would have been a couple years Um, but it was still all just sort of fun and games getting high da 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 but that sort of changed things a little bit and um, Somehow, I just felt a seriousness about doing the band that sort of wasn't there before. If you feel you need a break, this may be a good time to pause. We are about to launch into a 20-minute section devoid of musical interludes. I wanted to use as many voices as I could to tell the story of Crimp Shrine's one and only tour that turned into an epic tale of the band itself. I felt it would be best to let the words tell the story and to leave any background sounds out. In this section, you will hear from Aaron, then Jeff, introducing Paul Coran, and then, near the end, you will hear from Pete. After this section, we will return to the sequential telling of Crimshrine through their last recording session. First of all, when we went on the tour, it was me, Jeff, Pete, Iden, who was our second guitarist for a little while. But Iden, he wasn't a strong part of the band in terms of our identity, but in terms of his playing... He definitely was. And so I, I don't want to leave him out either. And this roadie named Zach, I think that, that there was a the balance of forces within the band kind of got thrown off. And, uh, and the roadie was, was a friend of Pete and Iden's, and he helped tip the balance, sadly, to the forces of, of rock. <laughs> we leave roughly 70 shows in 70 days. 
couple shows on the way, like, I forget, somewhere, and then in Chula Vista, like maybe L.A., and then Chula Vista, and then Arizona, and all the shows were really good. Some of them were insanely hot to the point where some of us were vomiting during the shows because it was so hot, but shows were really good. Uh, eventually, we got to um, El Paso, and the promoter was, um, I can't remember his name, but he was like, we got to his house, and he was like just staring at TV. He's like, okay, yeah, show tonight, okay, yeah, and oh, like Aaron's Aaron's kind of looking around. He's like, oh, yeah. Do you have a copy of whatever flyers you made? He's like, flyers? Yeah, I didn't think about that. Oh, jeez. So before the end of the day, we had gone to the place. Nobody was there. I don't even think there was other bands there or anything. It was just like, okay, this isn't happening, but whatever. We'll just sleep at this dude's house and then uh, make our way from there. And uh, so I think everybody was asleep in the van, and me and Aaron were inside this guy's house. And all of a sudden, cockroaches start showing up from all over the place. And we were taking coffee grounds and um, crushing up uh, tortilla chips and feeding them. And they started going fast. <laughs> and I think that might be their normal anyway. I think they just might have been excited that there was food. But in our minds, it was like we were getting the, the cockroaches wired. Anyway, they got freaky. <laughs> up and we just kind of walked off to go walk around. And we ended up uh, running into Ed Ivy from the Rhythm Pigs. And he put together a show uh, the next night in El Paso that actually happened. So we did that. But something about the first show that didn't happen at all, sort of like I saw this morale through the floor thing with Pete Iden and Zach. They weren't quite like the set of metal kids. It was almost more like they're like the Led Zeppelin kids. Pete and Iden and, and Zach were, but, you know, it, it, at the same time, everybody's the stoners, right? We're all in class. We're all in the park smoking dope instead. But the three of them as a contingent, I, I started to have this feeling of they're not happy with this. From my point of view, it was like, well, I'm a homeless guy at home, or I'm out here and I'm a homeless guy who people let sleep in their house, so this is totally better. <laughs> <laughs> so we continued on, and uh, I guess Pensacola is the point at which Pete's like, okay, you know, we got to talk, and the three of us in the van are going to go home. My amp, of course, wasn't my amp. It was Pete's amp, so it went home also. And so pretty much a guitar, Aaron's drums, whatever shit we had to sell, clothing and um, canned food items, uh, all got dropped off at Scott from the Headless Marines, his grandma's house in Pensacola. You know, me and Jeff went to a diner and that and made a list and the, the list was I think there was three different lists. One was people who played bass and drove. Neither me nor Jeff drove. The second list was people who either drove or played bass. And the third was just people we liked <laughs> who, <laughs> who, who, might, who might be out doing something ridiculous. Paul was on the first list. Paul, where were you born and raised? Uh, I was born in Southern California, but at a very young age moved to Northern California, and I was raised in Benicia. It's a suburb, but it's more of kind of an an island in the middle of nothing because it's separated by water from the greater suburbs of the Bay Area. Did you go to school at Berkeley? Oh, no. Nope. I graduated from Benicia High and didn't do anything for a year. And then I joined Crim Shrine. That was my college. <laughs> <laughs> he was someone that I knew as a real young kid. There was a lot of us in the Bay Area who were involved in punk when we were just 12, 13, 14, and he was one of them. Paul, who did you meet first in Crim Shrine, and, and how did that go down? I met Aaron first, and it was at a show at Ruthie's Inn in Berkeley, one of the very first punk shows I ever went to. And he was walking around with his... Comet buses in a little manila envelope, just sort of, sort of secretively almost uh, handing them to seemingly select people. <laughs> <laughs> and he, he approached me and asked if I wanted a zine. And of course, I was like, yeah, you know, like, what's a zine? I didn't know him well, but I had run into him one afternoon right after Crimshine had, had recorded, had done that 17 or 18 song session. And uh, he said, hey, what's going on? I was like, oh, I'm trying to get to Sacramento. And it's like, oh, cool. Well, yeah, let's go. I'll take you. <laughs> like, really? It's like, yeah. I'm like, oh, I'll buy you a hamburger. He's like, yeah, great. Cool, let's go. <laughs> and we drove up to Sacramento. And along the way, I had this tape of the recording that we just finished, and we just listened to it over and over. And he really liked the band. Paul, can you talk about uh, how you came to know about the band? So around 1986, 
I had kind of dropped out of punk or I had just kind of tired of what was going on in punk. And I still listened to Maximum Rock and Roll Radio every once in a while. And around the time that Gilman opened, so that would be December 1986 or January 1987, they played some local demos, which included the band Crimp Shrine and the song Tomorrow. And that just blew me away. Basically, there's no other way to put it, but that I was like, what is this music? What is this band doing? This is amazing. I've never heard anything like this before. And so I thought, wow, here is an ideal guy. He is willing to drive a car to some shit town an hour away for no good reason. And he likes the band and he plays bass. He was perfect. And surprisingly, he agreed to come out and save our ass. So, okay, so Aaron calls you and says this and asks if you can bring the Pinto. Well, even though it seemed crazy, it was certainly an opportunity that there was no way I was going to pass up. They were my favorite band. I would get to go on tour and get to be in the band. (laughs) So even though it was crazy and when I would tell people about it, especially my mom. <laughs> I'm going to take I'm just going to drive the pen out to Chicago and then drive across the country and back if that's cool. It took a, a little convincing. <laughs> but he said, "Well, I guess so, but I can't bring this car. I can't even trust it to drive to work." Well, eventually that's the car that he brought, but he said, "Well, I can't make it there alone. You know, I'll have to bring my brother uh, so we can both drive." It certainly made sense to not go alone, and he also was into punk new gilman but he wasn't a punk he was still more of a rocker i'm pretty sure that jack volunteered i wouldn't have been like yeah i'm gonna join crimp shrine hey jack you should come along but in thinking about like i can't drive across the country alone and jack wanted to go why not he didn't have anything better to do either what were your ages i was 18 and jack was 21 and especially we were going on the tour We did need somebody else to drive. I mean, when you can only drive 45 miles an hour, the shows were all over the place, Paul will tell you, but it really would take a full day to get anywhere. How did the Pinto do? Did did you make it uh, without adventure from point A to point B? Yeah, we made it. I mean, there were little breakdowns and every every little thing wrong with the car was like, oh shit, the car's dead because it just seemed like that kind of car. So when we hit the Rockies, we were just chug, 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 chugging up up the mountain at like 25 miles an hour. (laughs) And in Utah, the first time I had ever seen this, there's a minimum speed on the freeway and we were not able to do the minimum speed. So we were just like, we can't drive this car if this is how it is on mountains. But it turned out that uh, it just needed a fuel filter and then boom. And then it was going, I mean, it was never boom. (laughs) And then it was like, okay, (laughs) it's not, it's not dead. Um, So we were able to make it over the Rockies, but still at, 55 miles an hour instead of 25 miles an hour. And in the meantime, in Florida, we had gotten dropped off in Florida. It dropped us off in Florida, and then we played as a two-piece through Florida and just managed to get rides from show to show. I think we're at Scott's grandma's house for two or three days. In Pensacola, a kid named Sam Hill agreed to do the shows from Pensacola to the last show in Florida. And I don't know if that was... Gainesville or where that was but there was a few shows in Florida and so Sam Hill and his VW bug uh, with our stuff taped all over the outside of it because it wouldn't fit inside through the Florida shows that was actually a lot of fun and it kind of brought us definitely closer into the vision of what the band was in the first place and it was also funny because you know we we had played as a two-piece for years so for whatever reason, you know, the tour was already booked and we were having to cancel, you know, weeks of shows while Paul and Jack crossed the country. So, yeah, I called Ben. And I was like, Ben, we're in Florida. You know, it was one thing to get a ride from Pensacola to Tallahassee and to Tallahassee to Gainesville, but it was another thing to make to Chicago. Ben came down. The Ben that Aaron is referring to is Ben Weasel, the singer for my own band, Screeching Weasel. Ben convinced this kid with a... What's that guy's name? Lynn, right? Oh, yeah, yeah, Lynn. Lynn and Ben showed up in his Trans Am, which also really didn't fit everything. (laughs) So myself and the canned uh, food items in the giant army duffel bag went on Greyhound, and Aaron went with Ben. Paul and his brother Jack were already on their way out, all converging on uh, your house. We've been lugging, like, my drum set, a guitar, maybe an amp, I don't even know, and, like, a big bag of canned food. 
and a bunch of t-shirts. We push everything into the car and then there's no more room. So I managed to climb on top of it all. And then I gave Jeff the money to, for a Greyhound to Chicago and we were off. You know, it's kind of amazing that certainly amazing that Ben was able to convince anyone to drive down to Florida to pick us up. We were not a known band at all. Uh, and you know, again, I'd never, I'd never been anywhere further than Sacramento. The one time that Paul gave me the ride. And so, it was very exciting, but also, you know, we were young, but I, I did not feel young at the time. I was 20. I was a little bit older than the other guys in the band. I already felt like the punk that I had grown up wanting to be part of was already disappearing. And, you know, all these scenes that I'd always read about, this was sort of like I was years too late already. And so by the time I finally got out there, I didn't want to turn back for anything. When Aaron, Jeff, Ben, and Lynn showed up at my house in the suburbs, it would still be a few days before Paul and Jack would arrive. We had a few shows set up with Crimshrine and Screeching Weasel, so this is what we did. Did Ben play bass for us? Did you play bass for us? Did you both? We split the songs. You sent us a, a demo and Ben and I split the songs in half, so we both hopped up on stage. <laughs> yeah, you both ended up in the band, and then I played two or three shows as the Screeching Weasel drummer. The shows that, that you played bass with my band, I was playing drums with your band. So there was five of us making up two bands. Yeah, so I was to drive and meet them at your house, John Johnny Jughead, Mount Prospect. Yeah. Is that yeah. the name of the town? Um, that's what happened. We got directions to your house, and we drove up, and they were there, and you were there, and... I remember this, and I hope I remember it correctly, that we hopped out and got on our skateboards just from just like, hey, we're done, we're free, <laughs> and we're from California. And so we just like got on our skateboards and like, you know, like cruised out across the road into your house. And I remember you and or Ben just like thinking that was fucking hysterical, like <laughs> you fucking Californians and your fucking skateboards. <laughs> I can't remember if you guys rehearsed for any amount of time at the house you must have you know i don't know if we did because my main recollection of learning those songs was in the pinto with my bass and jeff showing me the finger positions because i knew nothing about what an a e g was my notes were little diagrams of where to put my fingers for each song <laughs> I, that's why i can't remember you guys having rehearsed i remember me and ben rehearsing but i was like what Paul must have rehearsed. Now that I think about it, we did not at all because when we played our first show in Burlington, Vermont, <laughs> which if we put together the story from here, yes, I drove to Chicago, joined the band, and we drove to our first show in Burlington, Vermont. That that was the first time I had played with them. That's another 14 hours, 14 and a half hours away. In the Pinto, add 50%. Yeah, and you had already come all the way from California to Chicago, which... That's like two days of driving, isn't it? I think it probably took us closer to three. So there you are. You, you, and, you and Jack drive three days to my place and pretty much turn around. Because I remember meeting you and Jack, but it wasn't long. And you turned around and then you got back in that Pinto with very tall <laughs> Jeff and Aaron. I remember everything even duct taped to the roof. You had like all the shirts and all the merch and stuff like duct taped to the top of the Pinto. Yeah, and, and it has a hatchback. And so the hatchback is open and just tied with rope. The bottom of the car was barely off the ground as you guys drove away down my street. So you had the four of you in that with all with equipment and all the merch and duct tape everywhere. It became known as like a duct tape tour, too. Yeah, that just became a running joke, though, that everything is fixed. Well, not even a joke, because when you looked at Crimshrine's gear, like, it was so fucking janky. And it wasn't a style. It was like... Just that everything was fixed with duct tape because that's what they did. Um, and, of course, yeah, that then became part of the uh, legend or whatever of Crim Shrine and duct tape soup. Can you talk to what it felt like to be playing around the country? I just want to get a little little background on that. Yeah, it was very, for me, very nerve-wracking, very exciting. I was not a very good bassist, and it took me quite a few shows before I felt like I knew how to play the songs. So basically, if you were at that first show or any of the first few shows, we probably sucked. I haven't talked to anybody who was at those shows who remembers, but I, I'm sure <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure it did not sound very together at all. Um, 
But then again, maybe I was able to hide behind them because they're super talented and played with each other for years and whatnot. But so for me, it was like it was that was the nerve wracking part. It's like I fucking do not know how to play these songs and I have to get up on stage and do it. So in a way, it was trial by fire and I totally had to learn how to play and it made me learn so much so quickly. And then, of course, it was just fun as it always is to be playing live punk rock and and also the tour itself was really haphazard and was being booked literally was being booked as we went so any given break aaron was on the phone with kamala aaron was on the phone booking shows on his own and we might not know where our next show is until we get a call back or something so and i had no idea that that was not how tour is supposed to work so that made it just an extra adventure to me. Like, where are we going next? We don't know. You know we already had this tour booked. It was a two and a half month tour. We decided, oh yeah, sure. We're finally going on tour. We should just make it as long as we can. And the two and a half month tour is not something that anybody seems to do anymore. And on the first tour, it was a little ridiculous. We would meet someone in one town and they'd be at the show there. And then they'd go off to college and then we would, they would go, you know, meet people in that new town and then set up a show for us there. It, it got to be that, that home was so distant that uh, the fanzines would come out in Berkeley about the band falling apart and they'd already, you know, be published and we'd see them when we were in Vermont or something. Pete, are you okay talking about the tour and the van? Uh, I can tell you that I, I feel that we should have never gone and I can tell you that I felt like I kind of... Uh, there's ways that I that I fucked up too. I mean, it's it's. Um, but there's, I don't think it's entirely my issue. I mean, it, there was a. Uh, I don't know. Have you ever done some something that uh, is destined to fail? You know, like a lost cause type of situation. But you do something to try and save it. Yeah, I mean, well, even band-wise, I could say that too. For like the last few years of being with Ben Weasel was exactly like that. <laughs> I wound up uh, making this three-piece, a four-piece, and totally changing the group dynamic, and that was uh, my fuck-up. And because uh, because I was best friends with the addition uh, of Iden, I was not going to take no for an answer for him joining up. However, it changed the group dynamic and made it an us versus them kind of scenario, to my mind. Uh, it was those two versus us two. And, you know, it's, it's, it's the one thing that I shouldn't have done at that time. And he was slipping from me. He was slipping from me, and so I did that to try and uh, save it. He, he meaning who? Uh, Iden was slipping from me as a, as, a, as a best friend, so... So, like, that was the thing I could do to try and save it. You're still on tape, right? I'm, I'm sorry, what? Oh, uh, let me say, so I want to say something about Pete. Oh, great. I feel like it was three or four years after the tour, and he called me up and he's like, hey, I want to take you out to lunch. Like, you do? <laughs> Pete? Is this Pete? Pete Riffin? <laughs> you know? Take me out to lunch. That isn't something we, you know, we did so much. And, you know, like, all right, all right. We met at the diner, and... He said, look, I really want to apologize. That was wrong of me to drop you off. I was selfish. I, you know, I wasn't thinking right. And I was, hey, I've totally forgotten about it. I actually don't care. Like, that was one of the greatest things that ever happened to me. And you don't need to apologize. He said, no, nope, I want to apologize. I feel bad, and it was wrong. And I want you to accept my apology. And I did. And, uh, Pete goes down in history as the one person ever <laughs> to actually just take the piss right out of something. Sometimes, you know, we do things, they go wrong, they end badly. But I've never felt any resentment to him ever since. You know, I didn't at the time, but maybe some would have lingered, and it was gone right away. And, you know, I'd also forgotten that besides being in a band together, we were friends. And, you know, anyway, I just really appreciated the fact that, like, yeah, you know, sometimes things don't always go well, but um, a well-timed apology and a free lunch is uh, really, really can do wonders. The last four songs in this podcast, featuring Aaron, Jeff, and Paul, produced by Kevin Army, 
are presented here through interview pieces about the last few months of the band, following the tour. The history is presented in a nonlinear fashion that couldn't be avoided in order to make this flow how I wanted. The next track is Fucked Up Kid, written by Aaron, including sound bites with Paul and then Jeff. Fucked Up Kid. A brutal part of youth that, as hard as you have it, nothing's going right for you. Your friends can write the song, and everyone will sing along about, you know, about being a fucked up kid, but 25 years later, when you're a fucked up man, it doesn't make a good song. I just, uh, fucked up man came to visit me three weeks ago, you know, the guy who I wrote the song about, and he's still a friend, and he's still a great guy, but his life's still hard, and that's something that, that, uh, that doesn't make a good punk song, and it's it's not going to get the crowd going. And that's one of the rough parts about punk is that uh, what, what seems cute and heroic when you're younger is uh, often, you know, a lifelong problem. Fuck that man. Try that, try that song on for size. It's not going to fly. Not, at least not with pumping fists in the air, probably. Yeah, there's no one's going to pump their fists in the air. <laughs> fuck your kid! I can't honestly say I remember the timeline of uh, what happened between the end of tour and the end of Crimshrine. That was only about three months. We got home, we had these songs, we went back to the practice space that we shared with Op Ivy, practiced them up, and maybe wrote a little bit more, and then recorded everything that Crimshrine had that hadn't been recorded yet. So that included a few songs from before I joined the band. Crimshrine wanted to do an LP. Lookout wanted something from us. Lauren Slivermore said, no, you guys aren't ready to do an LP. The band that had been together for six years <laughs> wasn't ready for an LP, but Up Ivy was. Um, and so just as a side note, that's why Lynn Gig Contest came out on a German label. And it was kind of a weird mashup of, of different recordings. I didn't have anything to do with writing the songs. That was always, I think, you know, even before I was in the band, it was just Jeff and Aaron writing the songs. So I would just have to either learn what they wanted me to do or figure it out on my own mostly them saying like the bass should go like this since i still wasn't a super confident or creative bassist at that point and that's one of the things that is a shame about the band breaking up so early was that i feel like i still never found my my voice i was still like just trying not to be pete we're back we did a couple of shows primarily though with John Repetto from East Bay Mud slash 15 slash a bunch of different bands uh, giving us rides to places uh, in order to do them. We played a couple Northern California, like way up almost the Oregon border shows, but, but it was driving us. But to a certain degree, it was like transportation was an issue, equipment was an issue. And, um, you know, it's one thing to show up at a show and ask Bad Religion if we can use their amps because half the band left, you know, one seventh of the way through a tour. But you can't really do that as a normal thing. <laughs> Aaron, tell us about Easy Answers. Well, you know, I don't want to seem critical, but uh, Easy Answers, I regret that song. I think there are easy answers. I think uh, an independent Palestine with Jerusalem as the capital. Do it and move on. No problem. So I, I don't stand by those lyrics. I like the song, but in fact... Uh, I would disagree. Well, unfortunately, we'd done the whole tour and the two and a half month tour, and we moved, we, you know, we got back, and it was really exciting. I still didn't even want to be back after two and a half months. We still weren't ready. We were like astronauts coming back to the Earth, facing the unfortunate reality also that it's easier to not have a house when you're on tour <laughs> and you know so I came back and you know moved in with my parents and went back to the minimum wage job to pay off the phone bill which was you know like more than a thousand dollars because we had to call and rebook every show as we went on the road and you know somebody in the van may have used the calling card for personal calls to his girlfriend but from afar and that rang it up, it, you know, ran it up a couple of extra hundred dollars. And so, yeah, I got back. I had to just go back to work. You know, our welcome back show was at Gilman. 
and Gilman closed like two weeks before we got back. It, it you know, the original Gilman was <clears throat> shut down and eventually, you know, reopened a month later. But I won't say exactly it was a rough homecoming, but it was sort of difficult to know what to do then. But Paul found this warehouse in Benicia, which is where he's from, which is a small town on the water up the Delta, about a half an hour. So he found this great warehouse that was $150 for the whole place, and we all moved in together, including Jack, Jack's girlfriend, Jeff's girlfriend. So there were seven of us, and it was pretty cool. But I don't know, the way that most things fall apart, it's, you know, problems that were always there sort of came to roost. I think when we were in a crisis mode, it actually worked better. Paul could come out and save us. And then eventually, I think it was exciting, sort of like, Pete leaving the band and, you know, us recreating ourselves. But then you realize you do have some of the same problems that I think we'd always blame Pete for everything. And uh, there is a song where, where it goes, make sure you have a basis for what you believe in. But it's actually a song, make sure you have a basis for what you believe in, with a little P added. And that was a little dig on Pete, even when he was in the band. But afterwards, when you no longer have a traditional bassist role is to, you know, to be the person that everyone hates. Sometimes the drummer gets this role, too. But when we no longer had the person to blame everything on, of course, there turns out to have been other problems that needed to be solved. We got back in October of 88, and the band really didn't even last maybe another four or five months. Early 89, spring 89, it fell apart. Yeah. Easy answer, no. Oh, I mean, you know, endings are never good for anything. I mean, whether whether it's your life or a relationship or, a, you know, a beautiful ideal or a club or a band, you know, endings are, are always going to be bad. So that was the worst, <laughs> the worst of all endings, you know, but... Um, but it doesn't, you know, the details aren't that important. It's just like a, a personal apocalypse for me. Inspiration was written by Jeff. Following his notes on the song, our interview pieces with Paul, and then back to Jeff. All right, I'm going to move on. Uh, inspiration. On the Crimshine tour, there was a few tapes, and that was it. And that was very important because the car went so slow that the tapes have a very exaggerated importance to this day. So we had, uh, what's it called, Late Night at the Thrill Factory, Mr. T Experience. And so actually that song, Wearing Out, was uh, we blatantly and completely intentionally ripped off in making the song Trying Too Hard, for the record. So there was that. There was uh, Run DMC, Raisin Hell, Dag Nasty, whatever that current Dag Nasty album was then, Can I Say or whatever. I think they had uh, the Sonics. But these were all Paul and Jack's tapes, just the few that they happened to bring with them. We basically didn't listen to it in the car, but Jack had a, uh, the, a tape of The Essential Jimi Hendrix, only it was volume two out of one and two. A couple times on the tour, but then quite a bit afterwards, especially once I moved to Bernicia, I was just listening to that and I was like, oh my God, this shit is amazing. And I sometimes, in retrospect, feel like a total idiot because uh, Aiden was really, he was into metal and he was into this and that, but, you know, primarily his interest musically was Jimi Hendrix and Steve Ray Vaughan. And I totally missed the chronological opportunity to learn that stuff from somebody who had already figured it out. And I kick myself to this day. But, so I was just being turned on uh, to that tape. Jack and Paul's mom, Mary, was out of town ostensibly for the weekend, even though she showed up earlier than we thought was going to happen. And a bunch of us were at her house. So we're there, and the Pinto's out in front of the house. We had been back from tour, I don't know, a few months or something. And uh, my girlfriend at the time, sore throat that became really bad sore throat in like a few hours, became, couldn't even stay awake, just like asleep kind of moaning, sweating profusely, and uh, I was on LSD, and I guess the backstory is adoptive family 
atheist, but I had enough experience with Berkeley in general and Sally, the art teacher, saying I was her father in a past life and enough experience with LSD to realize uh, there's a little bit more to everything than absolutely nothing, but who knows what the fuck. Um, so I'm on acid and my girlfriend is really sick and asleep and I went and I had the thought that um, I should pray for her to get better and so I did and literally before I was done doing that the sweating got super heavy and stopped and she suddenly woke up and sat up and she was like you wouldn't believe the dream I just had and I was like what and she was like I had a dream that I was just in terrible pain and I couldn't swallow and this light came down over me and it made it stop and then I just woke up now <laughs> and I'm all I'm all on acid listening to you say this and I was like oh well this is way too heavy so I grabbed the guitar and I went out and sat in the pinto and um, and I was at first I thought I was just gonna try and learn how to play Hendrix X S kind of you know I was just trying to figure out little pieces of riffs to figure out how to do it and before I knew it then that song was written. I'm gonna try to say something that I'm feeling and thinking but it's I don't think it's really a question but it's kind of like a well it could be if you have something to say to it but it's got to be and I want people to understand that you're working with these two guys that have been together for a long time complicated friendship with those two and writing relationship it must have felt so I don't know emotional to not be able to stop this train from crashing did it feel like that in the time like did you feel like other at that point like trying to hold yeah. it together yeah 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 and I certainly had an attitude of like I'm along for the ride with these guys and I feel special to have been asked to do this and and I'm totally down for whatever. So really, when it came to like Aaron and Jeff breaking up, I was like, okay, you know, that's what had to happen for them, you know. And I'm I, I'm not so invested and attached to this thing that I'm gonna cry about it or whatever. So to me, it was just kind of like, oh, you know, the normal sadness of like seeing some friends relationship end. But to me, it was also kind of weird because I was, you know, they were both like Jeff and Aaron were both to me these special kind of friends because of having that tour experience that I didn't really feel it was my place to take sides in the issue even though years later I know that I'm on Aaron's side if there is a side to be on like he and I have stayed close friends and I see that Jeff did totally like screw over the band and Jeff went and played a quote unquote crimp shrine show like to be the final crimp shrine show after we broke up him and his friend John John who played the drums and that, I, mean, I don't know why at the time I didn't recognize, like, that's the most shitty thing to do. Like, fuck you. Fuck you forever, you dick. Like, but, you know, like, uh, thinking about it a long while after the fact, it was like, yeah, fuck that guy. Fuck that guy and everything he did. So, not that Aaron isn't to blame. I'm sure that there was a, his side of it that was wrong because that's the way it always works. But, yeah, to answer your question, um, I didn't feel actually a part of the breakup at all. It was just something that happened and since I was along for the ride it was like, okay, well that ride's over. I don't want to go off on this because I think you, you said a lot on it, but was there actually a, a just someone saying we're done or is it, was it just sort of did, did it just like dissipate? My head's in the space of okay, I'm done doing this then all of a sudden it's like Op Ivy's going to stop being a band, there's going to be a last show I can't see myself at that age being able to ask somebody to put a band on a show. <laughs> it seems like that would have been beyond me at that point in time, but I think that must have been what would have happened. And I think I thought that um, John John, who had um, driven us around some before, and who also I already knew to be a person who could pretty much sort of just play any song on any instrument after hearing it once or twice, I, I thought that I would be able to put together myself and Paul and him and uh, do a last show at the same time as, as Off Ivy, which made sense to me in a beginning-ending kind of way. Uh, and uh, Paul didn't want to do that. Uh, me and John did that uh, anyway. And so in that sense, it wasn't a dissolve or fizzle out. It was a, I decided to be done with it.
Butterflies, written by Aaron, does not include an analysis of the song. Through this process, I've learned about the polarizing ways in which writers like to talk about their songs. Aaron opened himself up to be completely honest with me in regards to Crimshine, which I was honored he did. And part of his honesty was not having much to say about his own songs. And that's okay. Not all art needs to be explained. So here is Aaron speaking. And then over Butterflies, you will hear from Paul and then Jeff, speaking about his journey from the band Crimshrine into his following band, 15. I still have a difficult time trying to understand why Crimshrine became so important uh, to my story of, of my own journey, even though it was a short time compared to all of the other adventures both of us have had. And I even have a harder time describing what is the sound of Crimshrine. W- what did the band mean to you, Aaron, and, and how has that changed after so many years? I can't really answer what was the band to me and uh, how it's changed. I mean, it's just too complicated. I, I don't. I know, I know. Yeah. Um, but but no, 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 it's fine. But um, it's interesting that people that people did respond to us so much because, yeah, I don't know if it just like scratched a strange itch, or I think that you know, as a band, it did a little bit what a creative partner or or any partner like in life should do, which you know, it sort of like up the ante or captured people's imagination, and it was just a little bit of a uh like you know you can you can do it keep going and you know that things to be fun when they're a little bit ridiculous <laughs> and we definitely have that going for us yeah i don't know like how it played into to your life or other people's except that um you know we were a little bit like these weirdos from another planet you know where we would you know and and in Florida, they were like, we didn't know there was gay skinheads. There was such a thing. <laughs> <laughs> you know? They were like, you know, skinny. We talked for hours and hours and hours, you know? And we were like snorting coffee and um, just kind of living on fumes. So, you know, people found that endearing, but also not, not worrisome exactly. But, but anyway, just it just kind of... You know, they saw themselves enough. I think sometimes people want a little like permission or boost to to, uh, to be a a little a little weirder or to uh, take more chances. When I was younger, I did but a fight. Now I look around and realize there ain't no fun of fights around here no more. Some people everywhere and around the ones was there. They just try to get up in. We all ended up moving into a tiny, tiny warehouse space in Benicia, which we dubbed House of Toast. That m- must have been around December. And right about that time was when everything pretty much fell apart. And I don't know why exactly. I know that Jeff and Aaron had some issues and that Aaron left town and during that time, there was some Crimshrine money uh, that Jeff apparently spent, and it, it wasn't wasn't consulting <laughs> Aaron uh, or anybody about, and that was an issue, but there were probably other issues. I mean, like, one thing like that isn't going to break up an eight-year-long friendship or something, so there must have been other things going on, but it seemed that basically while Aaron was out of town and Jeff had spent this money, and then by the time Aaron got back... It was just like, that's it. The band is broken up. We played, our final show was New Year's Eve that we played this acoustic show under a bridge. These things must have happened in January. Under a bridge in Crockett, California, which is right across the water from Benicia. And it's where uh, Billy Joe Armstrong went to high school. I think we were at a party and uh, it was New Year's Eve. And then it was like, hey, let's go under the bridge and hang out and play music. So Crimshine played there. And then, you know, as it happens, that turned out to be the last time that we would all play together. Once we're all living in Benicia, oh, Aaron played drums for a, a Sweet Baby Jesus tour. He went and did that, and mainly part of knowing Jack for the first time from the tour was his musical uh, reality. A lot of it was like some of the stuff I was too young to get to just in terms of ACDC with Bon Scott or Motorhead or uh, a, a lot of just sort of that somewhat earlier stuff, but also with Hendrix 
and um, the entire subcategory of Southern rock. And so he's turning me on to all this music I'm not quite sure why I hadn't heard before. I guess I was just mainly listening to commercial rock, pop, radio, or whatever. But he started to get interested in, you know, how do you play this guitar thing? So that just, there was sort of this process underway of teaching Jack how to play guitar. And at some point, I just kind of looked at it and I went, uh, I'd rather be doing this than that, and proceeded. Jack is the first person I've known in my life who had been able to have a problem with drugs and or alcohol and managed to stop. And so he's also the first person that I've ever known who could just explain what all that is. And I, I was really, um, at, at the end of Prim Shrine, all band and music stuff aside, I was really at the beginning of a path that I, I started walking down then that in most ways, to me anyways, is way more important than any band or record or music or, or anything. I would not have made it past 25 had I not, you know, been shown sober and, and been helped with it and stuff. So in a way, I'm just starting to walk down this other road in that way but also Jack wanted to play guitar so it's like okay yeah let's do this and I don't I'm not sure at what point it was like let's actually write songs and have a band I guess that's just sort of what I did was write songs and have a band and, and I got loaded and so it's probably just I continued to write songs and then it's like okay we're doing this maybe it should be a band I guess now, I need to find. The last song of this sequential history, represented here, is Situation, written and explained by Jeff, followed by some last quotes from Jeff, and then Aaron, and one final time, back to Jeff. Situation. At the time I was in Crimshrine, uh, I had the beginning of a lot of different things. Like, here's the thing, I sort of have the beginning of it, I'm kind of walking down the road learning about it, trying to figure out how to live life in such a way that that thing or principle gets to exist and not just be talked about. A lot of those things, ending up hanging out with Jack a lot and then later on doing a band with him and um, getting sober as a result of knowing him, a lot of those things uh, got carried further or, or progressed quite a bit. And that in a lot of ways really is the next step after after just looking at the race part of it and i guess so you, you could say that the entire thing is what is some people call it the illusion of separateness the illusion that because we each have skin and that there's space in between you and i that we're not actually a single unitary uh, i'm not even gonna say species i'm gonna say biosphere really in the same way that we could say that, you know, E. coli are a germ and they're not me, but, you know, the minute you don't have it in your gut, you starve to death, <laughs> right? <laughs> a lot of hanging out with Jack, even though it was just sort of the folk ethics of the remnants of the 1960s America counterculture or something, is, is a lot of what was coming out of him just as a result of him uh, growing up with his parents. That really aided it in terms of me feeling comfortable walking further along in those different ideas and taking them out their natural progression. This is a little bit more of a, of a romantic sentiment for me, but Jeff, besides being both tall, thin, and in my remembrance, extremely soft-spoken and polite, yet intense on stage, what was the likeness or differences between you and Aaron that bonded you during this that whole time for years? <sighs> um... You know, I'm going to say uh, what, and, and I don't think it's specific to me and Aaron necessarily, but I'll just say, as an alcoholic and a, as a drug addict, I will naturally fall into both working relationship or romantic relationship or platonic relationship or friend relationship or band relationship with someone who does not use addictively but is uh, has a similar obsession with controlling my using as I do. You know, so uh, when we talk about the disease model of alcoholism, typically we think about dad's a drunk, 
mom's trying to fix him all the time, you know? And that's how we sort of look at the alcoholic and the codependent. The vast majority of any kind of relationship in my life has been, you know, I'm the alcoholic, the addict, the other person is the codependent. And strictly speaking, from my point of view, it was about control. Although, in retrospect, I know it's, it's really just about <clears throat> the disease playing itself out in everybody. At any point in time, if I simply get sober and do my own responsibilities myself, I don't have to end up in a place of dependency on anybody and then there isn't an issue of control of uh, me or my choices or, or whatever else, you know. But prior to becoming a sober person, that was all just sort of a mystery in my book. Also, if I'm going to represent this fairly, I, I got to say that my uh, 12 years prior to being in a band with Aaron uh, were primarily uh, centered around a really horrendously sick mom who is really focused on controlling me like literally in a minute to minute basis. And so that to, to whatever degree I uh, get irritated or don't want to deal with other people having issues about control or whatever, uh, I I'm seeing it through the lens of it's a thousand times worse than it really is. But from the perspective of Jeff Audit, 18 or 19, it was just like, I'd really had enough of that. I'm just kind of hanging out and playing guitars over here instead. And that dynamic isn't in play over here. And so I'd rather just do this over here. So I, I think that's the answer to your question. But, you know, really the answer has to contain that my illness is at least 51% responsible for the overall dynamic that's occurring, just one way or the other, if not 99%. <laughs> Besides both being tall and thin, in my remembrance, uh, extremely soft-spoken and polite, <laughs> yet you guys were very intense, what was the likenesses or even differences between you and Jeff that, that perhaps bonded you during that, that time? I think you talked a little bit about it earlier, but about working just the two of you, but... Well, I'm just kind of curious as to if you have any uh, statements about what you two shared that, I don't know, that made this band. I mean, everyone had their part in it, but, you know, everyone always remembers you and Jeff. Right. Yeah, no, no, it's true. Um, well, I feel like the statute of limitations has, has run out. I can no longer be tried for these crimes. But I also, I, I don't really know. It was obviously when something goes sour, you know, it has as much to do with what went wrong as it does, like, what you had hoped for and, and, like, what you thought the understanding was or what you thought, you know, that you have this, this vision of, like, a comrade or a life partner or just a creative partner that allows you to express yourself and to be yourself but also puts you into a different orbit, you know, like, let's gives you the chance to take chances and, and kind of ups the ante. And so... In that situation, in any situation that's good like that, that's what you're going for. And, you know, I think we did achieve that. In the end, you know, it was a disaster. But what in our in our specific makeup made that cool, it's hard for me to say. I definitely always had the, um, the sort of older brother role. And eventually, that's the dynamics. Those dynamics are really bad. And I think that often and in any kind of partnership you have that, you know, uh, where you either cast a certain role or you're cast in it, and then you get the good parts of it, but then you get the bad parts of it, and uh, and you sort of wish you had not. You know, the, those roles are hard to step out of. I'm prouder of other bands that I've done, and it happens that, you know, I've had like 30 other bands, and there's only like, three or four people out of all of those people who I don't get along with and I don't hear from. And unfortunately, those cast a, a big a big weight and a big shadow, but there's something like that definitely, although I'm, I'm prouder of some of the other bands, we certainly didn't do what Crimtron did in terms of, you know, I never actually did a full U.S. tour with any other band that was, that was my own band and definitely didn't, enter into people's lives in the same way. So so I know that there's something, you know, I know that there was something really special about it. I've got one paragraph for you. Okay. Uh, which is this. Uh, uh, 
when um, somebody's chronically homeless, especially if it, it starts uh, very early on, uh, there's, uh, there's a very real uh, risk of, um, well, suicide, essentially, of just like complete despair, hopelessness, and then suicide. Um, and uh, especially lately with reflecting with the other documentary and with anticipating uh, doing this with you this morning, um, you know, uh, I've, I I've ran into a lot of, you know, Sally Wolfer, the art teacher. Uh, had she not been the art teacher, uh, would I have even made it to 18? I, I kind of doubt it. Um, uh, there's, there's, in a way, a couple handfuls, but a lot more compared to what the average person ends up getting in terms of support in a situation like that 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 I got. But um, sort of the bizarreness and extremeness of of my first I don't know twenty years or or whatever uh, really leads me to believe that there are a few points uh, in my life that that it was just absolutely vital that some, someone or something stepped in and um, uh, turned a disaster into not a disaster. And, um, and uh, uh, you guys um, really uh, rescuing us as a band, you know, it, uh, it rescued a tour um, and, and a band but uh, that really was one of the most uh, acute moments of uh, me feeling like my entire life is failure and I should just throw in the towel um, when that first happened. And, and um, you guys uh, stepping up and helping us with that, uh, uh, I, I suspect was actually life or death really, for me. Thank you for listening to episode 14 of Jughead's Basement on its two-year anniversary featuring Crimshrine. If you enjoyed this podcast, please share it with your friends. Upcoming podcasts include The Pogues, Big Black, and The Vindictives. And lastly, I'd like to thank my assistant editor Jason Strange from the Six Foot Plus podcast. Thank you, and good night to you and yours. Thank you for listening to Jughead's Basement here on the all-new Jughead'sBasement.com. If you'd like to help keep Jughead's Basement free every month, click the donate button and give as much or as little as you can. The show is also available on iTunes, so take a moment and write us a review. We'll see you next month. <laughs>